giving you a voice, making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the fun. fun. First updates now, FRC is produced in partnership with the Blue Alliance. Keep up to date on all live and archived first robotics events and team stats at thebluealliance.com. And by viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Hey everyone, welcome back to First Updates Now Nor'easter Region Recap. Even though we may not have events this week or coming up, we're still here to bring you the content on the teams you want to see more of with our new Shallow Dives. Reporting for First Updates Now, I'm Audrey. And I'm Dave. And today joining us, we have Leith from Perennial New England Powerhouse and Mayhem Bringer 1519, the Mechanical Mayhem. Here to talk about their season, we've got Leith here with us today. If you want to talk about yourself a little bit, introduce yourself a little bit more. Hi, I'm Leith. Um, I'm a senior on Mechanical Mayhem. This is my fourth year on the team. And I have been in the design aspect of the team for the past few years. That's pretty cool. It's absolutely great to have you on the show tonight. But before we get into this, we have an epic giveaway for you guys. Tyler, what do we have? Yeah, coming in from our friends. By the way, we got to give big shout outs to all of our suppliers uh, who are still continually doing giveaways. Uh, we might not be able to ship stuff out right away, obviously, with people not being either in warehouse or something like that, but they still want to step up and say, hey, even if it's later, we'll get that to you. But our friends at Analog Devices are giving away another one of the ADIS 16470 IMU boards. These are the next generation IMUs designed for demanding high impact applications like those seen in FRC and used by so many great teams in FRC as well. Uh, so make sure you check it out. They do have have a, uh, a wiki you can check out, a GitHub library, and more uh, by going to analog.com forward slash first. So we'll give that away a little bit later on during the show. There's a keyword, of course, and subs get five times luck. Always just click that follow button, and that's your chance to get in along with that keyword. Good luck, everybody. Yeah, that's the I am for you. So the way we're going to go through this is we're going to ask you to elaborate on some general questions uh, about your build and the season. And then after that, we'll run through a few of those. Uh, we're going to pull some questions from our chat. So if chat has any questions they'd like to ask 1519, go ahead, type them out. We'll get to them later. Uh, so with that, uh, Leith, do you want to walk us through some of your build processes this season? Uh, yeah, for sure. So like most teams, we start the season thinking about strategy. Um, we actually spend the entire first week of our season thinking about strategy, and we try and think about the what before the how. So what are robots going to do before how it's going to do it? So we really don't think about the general design of the robot until at the earliest halfway through week one. Um, and we generally try and have a concept of strategy and what the robot will look like by that first Saturday. And that's normally when we break up into subteams. Um, from then, those subteams will start thinking about the best way they can tackle all of their assigned, um, you know, designs. So instead of splitting up into CAD or electri electrical, we split up into shooter and indexer, for example. Um, and that's a really good way that we can get each subsystem integrated efficiently throughout the season. Uh, we normally try and have a iteration zero robot. We kind of call it the the test robot. So we get a lot of the drive base parts in and we get a lot of the electronics assembled onto it and start testing our mechanisms that we've gone through extensive prototyping with. So this year we prototyped sort of the intake and we used actually old robots to prototype the shooter. So we used our 2012 robot General Vesuvius to prototype the uh, foam ball shooter and we actually used the 2017 robot as well. We, we found that the foam balls can go through any hole no matter how small. You just have to put enough power behind it. Yeah, I think we all learned that. Yeah, on I mean, our 3D, we used the, the 2017 shooter from 225, too. So, mm -hmm. yeah, Dave, what was that? Yeah, so during our prototyping, we uh, put a couple of the balls through some tight spaces. Not always on purpose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, did you see the photo of uh, the one ball that got stuck in Spectrum's drivetrain? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. There was somebody <laughs> in Northern Connecticut that had something similar, and they spent... I think like a good 25 minutes cutting the ball out. We had something like that happen to us too. We drove over a ball 
in an autonomous test of our trench auto at our practice field and it went right into the pulleys and the belts of the drivetrain and it gets stuck in all the little crevices of all the little belts and all the pulleys um, mm. and we used uh, actually one of the wago screwdrivers from texas instruments and we're just prying at the pulley for a good half hour trying to get it out all right so moving along down to so you all competed at your week zero event um so you talk a little bit about that event, and then uh, once you made it through the event, what were, what were some of the changes that you went through and kind of did while prior to going to that first week one event at Granite State? For sure. So at week zero, we learned a lot about how a robot performed really on the field. Uh, we had a practice field, and we had our robot up and driving around the end of week five, so before week zero started. But wow. we always feel it's really helpful to get you know, an ability to play on the real field with other robots and see how the robot's going to perform during a match. One of the things we found is that the balls got stuck as much as we assumed they would, but in places we didn't realize they would. So we, we, we found some areas in our, in our spin decks or revolver mechanism that we, you know, eliminated the cams there. We also discovered that our shooter consistency wasn't ideal at the week zero competition. So we worked on that for the, the week between week zero and week one, just working on the shooter consistency and stuff, trying to get those balls nailed in. What'd you change mm -hmm. for that, uh, for your shooter consistency? We added more support in the back plate. Um, we found that anytime the back plate can bend, you lose energy on the ball. Um, mm -hmm. We wanted to make sure the back plate was really rigid and enforced. We mm -hmm. also added a spacer at the top of the back plate to actually hold the back plate at a steeper angle at the very top. Um, through design, we realized that our, our radius of the hood was not consistent all the way up. So it was five and a half inches, five and a half, and then it became six inches of compression. Huh. Inches on the yeah, I think a lot of teams saw that just kind of designing it, but not really thinking too much about it. Um, did you have a, um, did your shooter modulate? I think I kind of see in the video you had a, uh, you were able to do infinite position. The yeah, infinite so, position. So we used a lead screw on our shooter this year to get the uh, infinite position, infinite variability. Um, we used the lead screw in 2012 for our 2012 robot, and we really liked it. Uh, you have high precision because the lead screw can turn a really small amount and move the hood a really small amount. Um, it doesn't drift a lot because lead screws just naturally have a lot of reduction in them. Um, and it was an easy way to look at an old design and learn how to make that better. So we, we changed the ratios on the gearbox and stuff. We we learned some new stuff about how to actually mount it because the 2012 way of mounting it was very 2012. Um, yeah. So yeah. we mounted it a lot better this time. And did you have presets with that, um, with each position or did you just kind of like change the angle, have the operator changing the angle on the fly? So our camera actually detects the distance away from the goal and mm -hmm. adjusts the hood to a specific encoder count and changes the RPM of the shooter depending on where we are in the field. Hmm. So the closer we are to the goal, the more the lead screw comes down and opens the hood up. Um, and hmm. we have our own camera system on the robot that can detect the distance. That's how it figures out where it is. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. And uh, pretty great to see how you applied that uh, going from week one to week zero. So. Um, can you kind of walk us through your first competition, Granite State, uh, really strong competition. Um, probably one of the strongest week ones we've seen in any for a while now. So how was going into that competition and uh, just walk us through your experience with that? Uh, yeah, for sure. So starting off, we arrived about an hour late to the competition because we were oh, no. <laughs> all of our autonomous periods at the practice field, getting them really working for the competition. Um, we appreciated not having bag time this year or out of bag time, specifically having access to the robot in that period helped a lot with working on software and mechanical stuff throughout the period between week zero and week one. Um, we walked into the competition hopeful with a lot of the autonomous as we were working on. And when our shooter consistency really got nailed down, we had a higher confidence in it really working. Um, and we were surprised about the level of play even, even yeah i think i think we all were yeah play. so many good robots there yeah yeah that was definitely something i saw at northern connecticut uh also week one was we were super impressed with all of the other teams and uh we kind of hoped that uh having no bag would be able to open it up so teams could have a more completed robot mm -hmm. um, 
but I definitely think that it it uh it really showed up and I would agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so did fifteen nineteen try to make any changes in the competition to try to keep up with that? Or did they just like keep practicing, keep going? Yeah, we were, the strategy we were working for that. on a ball net, like specifically throughout the competition. Um, we had this like garden mesh that we brought and we mm -hmm. attached that to our intake. We had a problem where the intake would sometimes spit balls out the top of it. Um, and we were trying to ensure uh -huh. the balls would stay in the robot after we grabbed them. Um, being a trench auto team, a low robot, we knew that we'd be grabbing balls and then driving away quickly. So we also wanted mm -hmm. to make sure we didn't have balls rolling out of the robot if we were driving quickly. So we worked a lot during the season on just, you know, implementing that ball net and stuff. Um, and during the competition, especially, especially we were, I don't know, we probably had 20 different iterations of it just at the competition, you know, zip tying a random point up or down or changing where that zip tie was to actually ensure that we had a solid ability to intake those balls. Yeah. So still speaking on week one, um, just kind of touching on the other teams, what what uh, what teams did you look forward to competing with the most? And uh, can you kind of take us through the alliance selection? Yeah, for sure. So we had some perennial friends there. Obviously, we had 319, 133, and 5687. So the really awesome teams that we've competed with before. Um, Northern Horizons, who we competed with at Granite State last year with the Outliers, was also there. Uh, mm -hmm. And they, they're a pretty awesome team. They're a rookie team as of 2019. Um, so this is their second year. Yeah, uh, second year's hard. Second yeah. year, is, yeah. They had, <laughs> they had a fun time, I think, though, getting a competition in before everything happened. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, Alliance selection was a little crazy. Um, 4905 ranked first. They had that consistent climb, and that really helped them get ranking points every match. Um, and they picked 4909 Bionics. No, they tried to pick 4909 Bionics, and Bionics declined. They were the second seed, so they knew they could make their own alliance. And they picked 133, who I think was in fifth at that point, and 133 accepted. Um, mm. After Bionics made their own alliance, we were happy to join up with our friends, the Outliers, again. That was exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love yeah. those. That's a so, great team. Yeah, you guys had um, the Outliers in week zero, too, but um, you were you got out in quarters or semifinals or some, semis, semis semifinals. Yeah. So what did, did you guys talk about that at all? Or um, what did you aim to change in between that with strategy? Uh, we communicated a little bit about like, oh, I hope we don't have another semifinal run. <laughs> <laughs> and we knew that climbing would be really important just because of how, how many mm -hmm. points there is in the climb. Um, we definitely, I think, lost to that triple climb alliance that, they, they, you know, they could having a triple climb in this game is so, so great. And mm -hmm. we talked about trying to get that done every time and we just, Slightly missed it every time we climbed. Oh. Triple. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah. So moving moving along and for the rest of the season, looks like we have a, a question in chat um, pertaining the the rest of your season. Oh, we're, so... we're gonna do we're gonna do chat later. Okay. Sorry. Well, <laughs> yeah, this kind of moves along with what we were talking about. Okay. So okay, well, um, then just do it. Who uh, was there anything about your robot that you would have changed for the rest of your season? So what do you what is the team planning on for the rest of the season? Do you have any fun projects outside of the robot or are you still going to be um, making making changes? I know y'all are mostly a homeschool team. Um, so getting in the school once things kind of cool down might not be difficult. So is there anything you got coming up? Yeah, and that goes with uh, Scotty, Scotty Mackin's question. As of right now, we're kind of taking things by ear, obviously. We're not meeting at the moment, you know, um, that just, you know, staying in quarantine is ideal. We've got social distancing here in New Hampshire, too. Um, we are doing virtual meetings uh, every every week or so in our Slack. Um, and one of the things that we are planning on working on this offseason is our demonstration robots that we've been working on for a few years. Um, and those are, those are pretty... Pretty fun little robots. They manipulate the 2017 fuel balls, and they uh, they hold three of them at a time. It's kind of the idea was like a mini 2012 sort of thing. What size are these robots? So these are just little like demo robots. Yeah, they're 20 by 20 with the bumpers on. Oh, that's pretty cool. So I love uh, tiny robots. That's so awesome. They're, they're really yeah. design electronics are you know we use an FRC control system and everything. The idea is to teach students you know newer students how to build the robot how to do the electronics on it, the CAD, the design, the drawings, all of that stuff. 
while also actually building a robot because we have a concept on mechanical mayhem that the best way to learn is to actually you know be involved and do the, the thing so if yeah, you know, absolutely. the best yeah. way to design a robot is to design a robot um so we you know we have seniors or sophomores or you know juniors who work throughout the off season to help students learn and one of the things we do every year is work on those demonstration robots we're hoping to have them done this year um mm. for the robot itself we were hoping on cleaning up some of the wire management, um, increasing the rate of fire in the revolver and spindexer. Um, we definitely were happier with it after we added a Lexan floor rather than an aluminum floor. The Lexan seems to stick to the balls better, so it helped them go around a little bit more. Um, but, you know, there's teams out there like Citrus Circuits that have a revolver sort of mechanism, and they just, oh, they dump those balls in the high goal so fast. Yeah, and that's for your um, in-season robot, right? Not the little yeah. tiny ones. <laughs> that's for the in-season robot for the, yeah. we called it Swing Shop this year. That was our robot name. Hey, Lathe, can you talk to us a bit more about this revolver and some of the design behind it? Why did you choose to go this way? I mean, it seems to be uh, a lot of work to it, but obviously very effective for you as well. Yeah, for sure. So the revolver itself we chose to go with because we felt like the balls would jam a lot. You know, we knew a lot of the Week Zero teams, uh, robot and 3 days teams were having problems. We knew a lot of teams nearby that were prototyping and stuff were having problems with the balls just jamming on everything. So we thought the best way we could do that is ensure that the balls never really try and touch each other too much. Um, so if you've got this big open revolver mechanism, then the balls can kind of just do what they want to do in there. And eventually, you know, our revolver, it, it moves the balls around into the, you see an omni in the top corner there. Um, so the balls can just move around freely until they actually want to be shot, and then we just turn that omni wheel on. So were the outside rollers also powered, or just the the outside internal? rollers are not powered? So those are so actually those are just passive. We got from Hobby Lobby, and we put them on quarter inch welding shafts, actually. Mm. And then so you just power the single uh, spinner in the middle, and then when you're ready to shoot, you just spin that omni wheel up. Yep, yep. And the floor is actually the floor spins too. So oh, really? Is attached to the. Um, little spinner in the middle and that whole thing turns. It actually uses the same pulley we use for our shooter turrets mm. Um, mm. to try and, you know, keep yeah. parts similar. Um, yeah. So the, um, just to talk a little bit more about Dave's it. Dave's curious there, now. <laughs> yeah, no, was there, when you were prototyping, so we also had something similar, but we totally threw it away quickly because we thought it would be um, just a little bit too complicated. Was there anything <laughs> else that you guys or your team prototyped prior to making that decision, or did you kind of prototype that early on, um, saw the potential of it, and ran with it? I think that's a that, that is sort of what we did. We saw the potential with it. We saw uh, 4481 was doing something similar uh, with it, and we really felt that it would be the easiest way to not get balls to jam. Um, we kind of prototyped a few different ideas on how to manu maneuver balls around. We played a lot with putting the balls against different surfaces, and having the balls touch each other and seeing what we could do about them moving together in a smooth way. And those balls, they really just, they do not like to move. Um, yeah, so I'm, yeah. I'm curious about um, your team, the team itself, right? So you, so how many, how many students are on the team? We have 13 students on our roster right now. 13, wow. and then how, how many of them are homeschooled? That's about 75% of our students are homeschooled this year. So where do you, how does the team organize um, the meets? Where do you, where do you, all of y'all meet? Uh, is it organized time? Do you get to meet during the day since some of you are homeschooled and don't have to be, most still in school? Yep, for sure. So one of the things we do, we meet out of a family's house. Um, we've met out of one family's house from 2000, like back in the FLL days, all the way to last year where we moved to another family's on the team's house. Um, our meeting time is organized 7 to 10 p.m. on weeknights, and then mm -hmm. we do all-day meeting on Saturday during the build season. Uh, and, yeah, during those busier times of build season, we do tend to meet a little bit during the day, um, just if we need to get things done, if we're behind our schedule. Mm -hmm. All right. So with that, Tyler is going to give us the keyword for our giveaway, and then we'll move on to some of the questions from our chat. What did we decide upon? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeehaw. Oh, yeah. Yeehaw. Yeah. <laughs> is that with an exclamation or without? Oh, without. Okay. So yeehaw is going to be the hard. keyword for your chance to win the uh, ADIS 16470 uh, IMU board. Just don't forget, you do need to make sure that you uh, are following all and subscribers get five times luck to win. 
Yeah, so taking some of our questions from chat now, Average Joe 6804 said, how much did no bag affect you and what was your build deadline this year? So I think we all agreed that one of the biggest uh, things we'd face, one of the biggest problems we'd face with no bag is actually not having a strict deadline. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. We thought that we might relax a little bit and kind of, you know, get into the mindset of, oh, we have so much more time than normal. Um, and we were really hoping a lot of our design was, you know, a lot of our build season was focused around not having to worry about that. Um, so we set a deadline, you know, our normal kind of deadline for having a robot working is as soon as possible. Um, <laughs> we were trying to, we, we did put together a build season schedule and that build season schedule had us with a working robot by the end of week four this year. Wow, that's that's pretty aggressive. Yeah, that's so, insane. <laughs> um, moving along, uh, C McBride one sixty six shout Connor. I wonder who he is. He, is. <laughs> he, uh, he was curious. Why did you decide to go short instead of tall? So we decided this year the ideal cycle path would be through the trench. Um, we decided that that pretty early on. Um, we saw the potential of being able to run an eight ball auto through the trench shooting the three off of the line, driving through and grabbing five and then shooting those. Um, we generally try and challenge ourselves a little bit with our design every year. So being able to go low and still play the game was definitely a big challenge for us this year. Um, but our general opinion about why going low instead of high was to keep that ideal cycle route between the human player station and the goal through the trench. OK. And then last question here before we roll our giveaway, Jonathan Lindsay wants to know, how do you recruit students and mentors? Good question. A lot of it is of word of mouth. So it's just kind of generally trying to, you know, put the, the word out into our community through demonstrations at our sponsors or at schools nearby, that kind of stuff. Um, but there's also homeschool communities nearby that we, you know, have online forums or groups for that we put our, you know, our stuff out there. Um, and mentors are normally parents of the team, um, people who've been with the team for a long time, that kind of stuff. So we have three mentors right now who've actually been with the team since the very start. Um, wow. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. OK, so I think that about does it. Tyler, you want to roll the giveaway for us? Yeah, we'll roll uh, for the, uh, once again, the ADIS 16470 IMU board for, from Analog Devices. You can go check them out more, analog.com forward slash first, uh, wiki.analog.com forward slash first as well. Uh, the winner of that is going to be Connor. What'd you get? <laughs> when you don't show up, yeehaw, you apparently win. So uh, congratulations, <laughs> Connor. Uh, yeah, lots of rigged emotes in chat, yeah, please. That's, that's that's like double rigged. So, yeah. Uh, But yeah, no, thanks again to Analog Devices. If you are watching live, we have other giveaways uh, tonight as well, too. Yeah. So that'll be all we have for you tonight from the Northeast. Thanks for hanging with us. And thanks so much to 1519 Mechanical Mayhem. Um, just wonderful to have you on, Leith. Um, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and Fun is once again asking for your help to stay loud, live, and independent. So please consider giving us a little bit of your support as a treat. You can join Fun Nation with a subscription or bits on Twitch, becoming a Patreon at patreon.com slash first updates now, or really just letting people know that this is the place, and quite frankly, going forward, one of the only places to be, uh, to get that fun information that you and you, your team need. Check us out on Discord, Facebook, Insta, Twitter, and even here, live on Twitch, and our videos on YouTube. On behalf of myself, Dave, Leith, and our producer, Tyler, I'd like to thank you for tuning in, and thank you to all of our mods in chat. Our next, our next show is going to be the first in Michigan recap, uh, Infimidation, and we'll be back next week on the Nor'easter region recap. Two weeks, every other week. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. You can also directly help support fun by visiting our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash first updates now or by subscribing at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and tier two plus subscribers on Twitch keeping fun loud, live, and independent.